Hello, everybody. We've got a great crowd tonight. My name is Mike Yaley. I'm the director at the Lair of the Bear, and welcome to our ninth week guest speaker series. We've been having a, a lot of fun doing these speaker series uh, every week on Tuesday nights. And just a couple of things before we start. A reminder that we are recording. So if you don't want to be on the recording, please stop your video and just listen in. Uh, also, we have asked for questions ahead of time. We'll go through those. But if we have time, we'll also be taking questions via the chat. So if you have a question you want to ask, please put it in the chat and uh, we'll get through those if we can. Uh, again, also, if you uh, mute yourself or you're going to be on mute, but if you become unmuted, uh, we will mute you. We're going to try and keep this so there's not a lot of background noise. And with that, I'd like to get started. Uh, our speaker tonight, we are very fortunate and very happy to have the Director of Athletics, Jim Knowlton, with us. And moderating for us tonight is the Assistant Vice Chancellor in the Office of Communications and Public Affairs, Dan Mogulov. And at this point, I'm going to step aside and I'm going to hand it off to Dan. Thanks, Dan, and uh, have a great evening, everybody. Mike, thanks so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm also a Week 7 Camp Blue camper, and I'm sure at least I know going into this, we have one thing in common, that uh, we missed really special experience this summer. Uh, but anyway, without further ado, D Jim, I'm so glad you could join us um, today. I know intercollegiate athletics is something that's of great interest to, to alumni in general and people who go to the lair in, in particular. So maybe you can just start us off by opening up a little window to what your life is like in this summer, unlike any other, as we're about to start a fall semester, un unlike any other. The issues you've been dealing with and where things stand with Cal Athletics. Well, first of all, I have to start by saying I would much rather be up at the lair of the bear right now um, talking uh, at the gold stage versus uh, sitting in my kitchen. But um, really nice to see everybody's faces. It's, it's exciting, and, and it sounds like Mike and the team have been getting lots of projects done up there. So uh, certainly next year when we get up there, it's going to be gold-plated uh, is what Mike has promised us. So um, – you know, the summer's been interesting, and I, I think back to March when um, we – probably the hardest decision I had to make going to the men's basketball tournament in Vegas uh, was not bringing our band and our dance and our cheer teams, you know, because we were hearing about this thing, COVID-19, and, you know, the next night we won a huge game against Stanford, who was favored, and, you know, we were we were ready to take on UCLA the next day, next day in men's basketball, and – you know, all of a sudden the bottom dropped out and, you know, the tournament was canceled. All of the winter and spring sports were canceled. And, you know, and then all of a sudden we were dealing with a new reality like everyone on this call has been dealing with. And so, um, you know, we've been spending a lot of time and I think our, our motto has been over communicate. So whether it's with student athletes, whether it's coaches, whether it's our athletic department, you know, our fans, our supporters, uh, we've really worked hard to over communicate. And I think we've learned so many neat lessons. Uh, I didn't even know how to spell zoom when this thing started. And, and, you know, now I'm, I'm doing 11 calls a day and uh, you know, we're using it in so many just incredible ways to, to stay connected. And, you know, and now we're really focused on our student athletes. We're focused on, you know, the health and safety uh, of those student athletes who have come back for voluntary workouts you know, we're doing a lot with social justice, you know, working with our, our young men and women and our department and, you know, our black coaches and our black staff. And so, yeah, we're, there's no shortage of, of um, challenges as we try to figure out budgets. But, you know, mostly I think it's still student athlete focused. That's really what we do for a living. And, and um, I did another Zoom call today. I've been doing Zoom calls with each team. And uh, today it was women swimming and and just to, just to see them smiling and the energy they bring and, you know, every one of them, Mr. Knowlton, bring us back, get us back. We want to get back to, to Berkeley because, uh, you know, our teammates are there and, you know, all our friends are there. And, of course, I'm saying, yeah, that's, that's probably exactly why we may not want to bring you back because all your friends are there and, and we're, trying to, we're trying to do a great job social distancing and preventing the, the COVID from spreading. But, yeah, it's been, it's been a different summer, but – uh, again, I think we've really focused on continuing uh, to solve a lot of the challenges of athletics, both strategic planning wise, 
um, so that when the lights do go back on, we're far better than we were going into this and, and we're continuing to, to improve. What, Jim, am I to understand the student athletes call you Mr. Knowlton? They do. Some All of them right. call me Colonel, but most of them call me Mr. Knowlton. Got it. Wow. Huge respect. Um, for those of you who just joined us, we've got some questions, a number of questions that were submitted in advance. Um, but please, if you have questions as we go along here, uh, just enter them in the chat section and we'll do our best to get to everyone that we can. Um, Jim, let's unpack some of the issues you talked about. So where do things stand exactly right now for the football season? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and you're the first one to ask that in the last eight minutes. So, um, yeah, everyone wants to know what's going to happen in the fall. And, you know, I spent a lot of time today uh, with our chancellor, who is an absolute rock star. Um, you know, Chancellor Christ has been phenomenal during this um, challenge. And I think um, everyone on this call should feel really proud that she's leading the, the school because she's, um, she's savvy, she's smart, she's got a great touch. And, uh, and you know, today we were – managing all of the CEOs of the Pac-12, presidents and chancellors, and, and um, you know, trying to figure out what do we do with football based on the, the current guidance we're getting from medical experts, both at Cal, Pac-12, and across the nation. And, you know, I think for football, right now we've got our football team back for voluntary workouts. I, I feel like what we're doing is incredibly safe from our testing protocols to all of the social distancing that we do and and they're not inside everything they do is outside for their workouts and no contact uh, but as we get further along uh, that's going to be inevitable and we're really trying to figure out um, what does it look like and can we continue to maintain uh, this this healthy environment if we have to start having contact and so it was a long talk today and we've put some markers on the wall of when we're going to have to make you know those tough decisions yeah. Um, and what's happened with players returning so far? Have you had positive tests among the among the kids that have come back? How's that all worked? That sort of returning to campus even voluntarily? I know they're being tested. What's what's happened so far with some of the yeah, students? We've got a really strict protocol where they return, we quarantine them for 14 days, we test them. You know, when they get back, we test them about halfway through their quarantine. Uh, and then we've been testing them on a, on a significantly regular basis um, so that uh, we can catch any issues that may come up. And we've tested, we've had 550 tests of our 150 athletes and we've had 10 positives. And so, um, you know, I had, a, I had a question from a faculty member recently when there was a, uh, you know, the fraternities had a little bit of a blow up um, from a 4th of July party and the question was, Jim, can you guarantee me that none of your student athletes were at the fraternity party on, on the 4th of July? And I very nicely said, no, I can't guarantee you that, that no one was there. But what I can tell you as we've had no spikes in the number of tests that were positive, we haven't had any additional positives. So I feel really good. And we haven't any, had any positives in the last couple of weeks. So, um, I think our student athletes are being very responsible. They know that uh, their behavior, both with us and, and when they are back in their, you know, their housing is critically important to their opportunity to play in the fall. And so, uh, yeah, I feel good about what we're doing. We've mitigated a lot of risk, uh, but as if everybody on this call knows, uh, there's no one that can say we've completely eliminated any possibility that someone could come up positive unless we put them in a bubble and, at a military academy, that's what, that's what we probably would do. That's what they are doing. But, you know, that's not something we're going to be doing at uh, the University of California, Berkeley. Yeah, got it. You know, I recently did an event with Chancellor Chris, and she talks about these three overlapping crises that have hit the country and the campus. And I'm wondering to what extent it seems to actually, to a large extent, they're also washing up on the shores of Cal Athletics, namely the public health, the epidemiological crisis the financial slash economic crisis, and then um, a crisis around racial justice um, and around uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. You wrote, you put out these monthly newsletters, Knowlton Notes, and you wrote what I thought was an exceptional, heartfelt, 
a pretty raw message um, about how horrific you had found recent events. How is that issue playing out? How are you addressing it? How are you confronting the issue of racial justice within Cal Athletics right now? Yeah, it's a great question, Dan. And I think we were very fortunate that my whole first year, we spent developing a strategic plan. And um, we had almost the entire department involved in some way, shape, or form to develop it. We came up with seven strategic goals for the department and two of them, one was diversity, equity, inclusion, and one was, you know, our athletic department, um, climate and culture. And so um, we had thought through inspirational and aspirational goals for the athletic department. And so when this hit us, we were in the midst of, of like probably five or six major initiatives uh, that we're in that area of, of um, social justice. And so, you know, one of them, we just finally were able to announce we've hired a, or we're in the process of hiring a diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, senior staff member that'll be on my staff uh, to really help us continue to educate, to continue to listen, and to create an environment that's incredibly receptive for everybody who's part of it, uh, both in our department, our student athletes, and anybody, anybody who has contact with our department. But I've also done a lot of listening. I do a monthly meeting with all our black coaches and staff and really do a lot of listening and then report out on, you know, the accomplishments that we're working on uh, and the things that we've been able to do over the previous month. You know, I've met with all our black student athletes. Um, and I've also done some really neat training with our entire, uh, our entire staff, you know, 300 people in our department, and really we've used outside resources to help us educate, including I, I did mandatory training online uh, on implicit bias for the entire department. And what people keep coming back and saying is, wow, I feel like I'm learning and I feel like I'm better prepared to be welcoming uh, in the department, which I think is a key piece of what we're trying to do. Yeah, so you know, speaking of that and a related issue, and I'm sure a lot of folks are aware of recent developments where there appear to be a number of student athletes from football programs in particular across the Pac-12 conference who have formed an organization, I'm not sure what to call it formally, um, and appear to have a set of demands or requests or interests, I'm not sure you, you'll tell us, um, around health in the context of the pandemic, um, around racial justice and around potentially revenue sharing. Is that something that's a live front burner issue at Cal? Have students come forward? What, give us an assessment or your own reaction to where things stand and what your own feeling is about that. Sure, I, and I think, you know, we had a meeting with all the football coaches of the Pac-12 today. And um, over the weekend, I talked to the three student athletes from Cal uh, that were, you know, had signed the letter. And, and you know, I think really they want to be listened to you know, each one of them said to me, Mr. Knowlton, this has nothing to do with Cal because we're so well supported at Cal, but we feel like some of the other schools don't do what you guys are doing for us and what Coach Wilcox is doing. And uh, we want to help stand up for our, our brothers and sisters around the league. I think their biggest concern is the, the COVID, the health issue, uh, which we're working, you know, day and night on. You know, I do think that, um, you know, there's some other issues that they brought up that, you know, are also being, you know, they're in some place, you know, whether it's the NIL name, image, and likeness where, you know, Congress is working on that with the NCAA right now. Um, you know, the revenue sharing piece, you know, I, I had a talk with them and, you know, I, in our athletic department, we'll probably be $25 million short that we're going to have to make up because of lost ticket sales and lost revenue. And, you know, when we got to that point of our discussion, I said, now, I'm a little bit excited about what you guys have proposed because I'm sure in a year where we've lost money, you guys are going to do bake sales and sell, sell brownies to help us raise money to make up the deficit. And they looked at me and, and then uh, I, I chuckled and then they all started laughing. But yeah, I, I, think, I think their main concerns are the first couple, you know, that really are important to them and, and they, they really want to see us continue to push hard to, to help them. So somebody asked, um, one of the questions that was posed while you began to talk about this, somebody who asked, 
do you think it's appropriate? Do you think it's right that these societal issues like Black Lives Matter surface within the context of an intercollegiate athletics program? Or is, for, is it for you part and parcel of what you're at Cal to do? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's interesting. If you look at the demographics of our athletic department, both our staff and our student athletes, we have 30,000 undergraduates and in our athletic department of 850, we have approximately 40% of all the African-American males on campus. Wow. So think about that. 40% of the African-American male students are in our department. And so, you know, we're very diverse. We're trying to teach our young men and women life lessons. And, you know, I'm convinced I spent 26 years in the Army. Um, organizations that are not only diverse, but are inclusive and accepting of diversity and, and leverage diversity are far better than those that don't. And I think the lessons that we're trying to teach our student athletes off the field are those life lessons that are going to set them up for success for life. And so the fact that we're dealing with social issues within an athletic department with 850 student athletes, it, it's just part and parcel with preparing them for life after, you know, life after Cal. Speaking about that, um, in your opening comments, you mentioned something about the Cameron Institute. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that's all about and why that's such an important part of your agenda. Well, it's interesting. In my first week on the job, um, and it was an incredible week, you know, I threw myself a party on the first day, and uh, it wasn't really for me. I said, I'll buy all the donuts and coffee, and, and I said, I'll be in this, you know, the club room for – for two hours. If anybody wants to come up and, and shake my hand, it would be great. I'd just like to start putting names and faces together. And, and uh, I walked in at nine o'clock and all 300 people were standing there and someone handed me a microphone. And so my thoughts of sitting with a cup of coffee and just shaking a few hands went out the window. But by the end of the week, um, I won a, a, our department won a national championship, an NCAA championship. And Brian Cameron sat in my office and basically told me that we suck at developing student athletes. I was like, well, it's great to be here too, Brian. Nice to meet you. Um, but he challenged me and he said, I've been trying to get the athletic department to take student athlete development seriously. I've made this offer multiple times now. And um, what he didn't know about me is I'm very competitive. And uh, if you challenge me, I'm, I'm going to go after it. And so um, our whole team got together and, about eight months later, he committed to a $12.5 million gift to stand up the Cameron Institute, um, which is really has three legs of the stool and it's, it's community engagement, it's personal uh, and professional development, leadership development, and then it's uh, career development. And so um, we've started hiring. We just hired our fourth individual for the Cameron Institute and it's gonna be absolutely transformational for student athletes and it's going to be transformational in the world of, of uh, athletics because we will be the gold standard that all other athletic departments will, um, will certainly try to mimic. And I think what we're integrating into that is some of the education training for leaders um, that include diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, along with many other things uh, that will help them in their life after, life after Cal. Super. We'll look forward to hearing more about that in years ahead. I want to turn to some of the questions that are coming in from folks who are watching us. And again, for those of you who joined us late, if you've got questions for Cal's Athletic Director, Jim Knowlton, um, just post them up in the chat function there at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to get to all the questions they get posed. So here's somebody's asking, um, what advice would you give to high school athletes that are aspiring to become student collegiate athletes at this moment in time? Well, what I'd love to tell them is come sit at my dinner table because I have five sons who are all college athletes. And, and I'd love to say I'm now an expert on it, but each one of them had a different journey. Each one of them chose a different type of school. And, and um, you know, I think for me, if you're in high school, uh, taking care of business in the classroom is, is your first and foremost priority. And, uh, you know, you can imagine our coaches can't even talk to you know, many of the incredible athletes that would love to come to Cal uh, because they just don't have the academic um, 
the academic background to excel at, and, and thrive at Cal. Uh, and then I would say, you know, continue to work at your craft to become uh, exceptional in anything. It's going to take 10,000 repetitions, as we all know. And, um, you know, those are the two big things. And I think what I talk to parents about all the time, and we've been doing multiple calls with parents over the last couple months is, um, you know, we, we really want young men and women who are well-rounded and are, who are good young men and women. And so those are all critically important to, to being successful in college. And, and again, the best student athlete, oh, excuse me, the best athlete oftentimes doesn't end up in a Cal locker room because we're really looking for student athletes uh, who want more than just uh, an athletic experience. And uh, that's where Cal excels. So I, I think I hear you saying, or actually what's interesting is what you're not saying, is that for a high school student who may aspire to play um, at, at a D1 university like Cal um, at, during this moment in time, this extraordinary moment in time, that they should continue as if all is the same. In other words, focus on schoolwork and getting better at what they do, but nothing particularly different in terms of if we're thinking of and speaking to high school seniors. Yeah. I think the only thing I would say that's probably a little bit different is right now our coaches would normally be out watching fall sports or they would have watched a lot of spring sports and, and um, now they're relying on video that's a year old maybe. And, and so you probably have to be a little bit more of a salesperson, you know, so for, for all those potential student athletes out there, let a coach know you're interested, let them know your coach's name, let them know how you've done in school and what, why Cal is so um, intriguing to you and why you'd like to be a Cal student athlete. Uh, because as you can imagine, there's hundreds of thousands of young men and women who would love to go to Cal and be in a power five, um, you know, division one program. Uh, but there's only 65 schools in the country that are power five division one um, athletic programs. And so it's, it's a tough cut. And so by putting your name out there, you know, if they're looking through 100,000 people and there's a couple that have written to them, they're going to at least get the first look. And, you know, a coach is going to check, you know, whether it's, you know, how fast you run the mile or, or um, how fast you um, or how, how many goals you scored in soccer or whatever it is. But, you know, certainly being a little proactive more than normal would, would probably be helpful. Now, here's a question in a, in a somewhat different vein, but also related to the pandemic. And that's, has the pandemic made you question or reconsider what this person calls the outsized role and in influence that sports has at Cal and at major colleges and universities in general? And maybe you want to start just by opining on whether you think athletics does have an outsized role and in influence at Cal and then how the pandemic has shaped your thinking. Sure. And I mean, this is probably one of those that we could talk and debate for, for days on end and and I've had some of these great discussions with our faculty at Cal. Where I come from, obviously, is I believe that um, athletics brings such an opportunity to young men and women to develop and grow both on the field through competition and, um, and through the life lessons that you learn working with people in a locker room, compromising, um, you know, working together. And, uh, and I think that's invaluable. And, you know, I've seen it in my five sons. You know, my baby is the last one in college still, and uh, he's a senior at the Air Force Academy. And I look at what he's learned through athletics and, and how it's helped him grow. And then I look at the larger piece of uh, the university and how there are not many things that happen on a university that can bring as many people together um, as athletic events do and, and build camaraderie amongst our alums and and our fans. And, you know, I went out to China last year with our basketball team and I was blown away at how many people, you know, at all hours of the night are finding ways to watch our teams and support Cal and get together as groups. And, you know, I think it, it brings camaraderie to a university. It develops young men and women. And uh, I, I certainly feel like it has a, a great role. Now I, in my previous life taught civil engineering at West Point and I'm a professional engineer by trade. So I've been on the academic side and, and um, I feel like I can bring a good balance uh, to an institution, both balancing the academics with the athletics to make sure that um, our student athletes understand uh, their priorities while they're, while they're in school. 
And so, and has the pandemic changed your opinion one way or the other about the role of intercollegiate athletics at universities in general or Cal in particular? Not really. I mean, I still truly believe in the mission, truly believe in what we do. And um, yeah, obviously, since I'm fighting a major budget crisis in my athletic department, I'd certainly like to find other ways to generate revenue um, in addition to some of the big revenue generators. But no, I still think it's a critically important piece, even in a pandemic. And I think if people could see the work our coaches have done during this time with communicating with our student athletes, um, you know, we've had so many fun Zooms like this one where one of our coaches got two of the Olympians that were made the Olympic team in 1980 that we boycotted. One of them had written a journal, a uh, diary during the whole, the whole event and read it to our student athletes when their season was canceled. And, you know, it just resonated with everybody that, wow, we're not the only ones who have ever gone through a, a disappointment. And, you know, and we've used some of our Olympians that had made the team this year. And then, you know, now are training again for another year after they just peaked to go to the Olympics this summer. And, and so, yeah, I, I do think it just brings so much diversity uh, to a campus. Uh, and I think that's the value. Got it. Um... You mentioned something about revenue and engaging fans. We've got a number of questions here about whether you and Cal Athletics have any plans to live stream uh, football games or other sorts of games. Where do things stand? Is that something you guys are talking about right now? Yeah, it's a great we, – we're working really hard to look at all possibilities so that it's not just live streaming, you know, football and basketball, but how do we, how do we also get the Olympic sports um, – and, and of course, it costs money and people and all that, but we're trying to find ways that we can certainly give people the opportunity to watch all of our sports, knowing that they can't come to Edwards Field or, or, uh, or Edwards Stadium or, you know, any of our facilities uh, during, uh, during these times of the pandemic. So, yeah, we're looking at that and we're working hard to, to find ways to keep people connected. Yeah, so speaking of that, what else besides live streaming? Somebody asked, how do you plan to engage with fans? Is it just all Zoom all the time, or are we starting to think of other ways to maintain and reinforce those human connections we have with each yeah. other? Well, I think we've done a lot. You know, I, I think I told you earlier about our Fan Fest, where we had 6,000 people join us for a Fan Fest, and we had the band, you know, play the fight song from 20 different locations on a Zoom. You could see them all, and, and uh, you know, we're, we really have worked hard to to really share with our fans and, and sort of get them behind the curtain to see, you know, how we're doing the things we're doing during a pandemic. And, you know, we did four coach caravan events with different groups of our coaches. You know, one was pro bears. So we, we brought in some of our pro athletes and they came back and they talked about how Cal prepared them for life after, you know, after Cal, both as a professional athlete and then beyond now that they're, you know, in a different part of their career and you know Ron Rivera talked at length about how his Cal experience in the athletic department you know has prepared him both for a you know an incredible NFL career but now as an NFL coach and managing a large organization and and so yeah really exciting and and our last one was celebrating 150 years of women uh, at the University of California Berkeley and you know one of the things that we did is we kicked off that celebration this year uh, with our basketball game, women's basketball game, Stanford uh, versus Cal. And our honorary coach was Chancellor Chris. <laughs> and so she had a blast. She bragged about it at the next um, Chancellor's Cabinet meeting. And before the end of the meeting, every single one of our senior, um, senior women on the staff had said, why can't I be an honorary coach? And so we had a different honorary coach the entire rest of the season uh, made up of just all of the leaders around campus, which really made it fun for our young women and, you know, obviously our, our coach, Sharman Smith, who's in her first year. Yeah. Um, going back to questions that are coming in from folks that are watching, again, for those of you who joined us late, first of all, welcome. Uh, second, if you do have questions for Athletic Director Jim Knowlton, feel free to post them in the chat function there at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer them. Jim, here's the next one. comes from Aaron. With so many colleges for a student to choose from, if they did not have Cal as one of their choices, 
what would you say, or if they did have Cal as one of their choices, what would you say to them to try to get them to sign at Cal over all the other choices they have? It's something I, I talk to recruits every week when we're, when we're in the office and I've been doing it with Zooms. You know, what I would say is if you're just coming to be an athlete, probably not the right place. If that's all you're concerned about is your athletic career, um, coming to the number one public university on the globe is probably not what you want. But if, if academics are important and education is important, if you want to be part of something special, and I truly believe our athletic department is on this incredible upward trajectory right now with things like what's happening with the Cameron Institute, how we take care of student athletes, you know, success on the football field. I'm sure many people on this call don't know it, uh, but we won the ax back this year after a decade. Did anybody know that? <laughs> All right. Um, you know, and we won a bowl game against Illinois and, you know, our basketball coach won games that we never thought, you know, our swim team won a national championship. We, we have incredible young men and women and, you know, what, it doesn't get as much press in the paper, uh, but our academic progress rates and our graduation success rates and our GPAs are absolutely the best they've ever been right now. And I'm talking in the history of our department. And so we're excited that our coaches are recruiting those type of student athletes that prioritize academics and are also incredible athletes. And it's allowing us to win in the classroom and on the fields of friendly strife. Got it. Um, you don't have any way of knowing this. I've been doing something very dangerous for the last 15 minutes, and that is I've kept um, a guy by the name of Tuck Coop waiting. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, you don't want to keep that guy waiting, former director of the camp. He tells me he's one of the most important people around, so I better ask his question. And his question is, on a scale of 1 to 10, from 1 to 10, 1 meaning there's no chance, and 10 means we'll definitely have a football season, where would you put it right now? So um, what I would say is this. We will definitely have a football season, I think is probably an eight. When we will play that football season, um, I'm probably at a five. Uh, when I took this job, there was a crystal ball under my desk that I use quite frequently. But right now it's... Um, you know, it really is like the Thule fog is all around the, the crystal ball. And so, yeah, I, I really think that we'll probably have a football season, but I think that it may be partially in the fall, partially in the spring. Um, it could be in the fall without fans. Uh, right now, we're working through that. and We're probably in the next two to three weeks, we'll have a better idea. We just went to a 10-game conference-only schedule um, for a lot of reasons. One, it allowed us to delay our season, you know, over three weeks for the start of the season to buy us some more time and allow us to, to sort of exercise some tactical patience. Um, but um, I think as we look at the 10-game the schedule, it also was important because we know the Pac-12 schools are doing the same kind of testing we're doing. They have the same kind of protocols we have, and it would have been a lot harder to ensure that if we were playing our non-conference game. So our schedule now gives us flexibility that I can flex two more weeks and delay the season for us. I can cancel our first two games and put them at the end of the season. So I think we've built in flexibility. We don't have to decide right now. Um, and as you all know, four weeks ago, things were looking so great that I would have told you nine and a half. And then we sort of hit this, this downward trend and now we've plateaued again. And so, you know, it, it's crazy, but I don't think there's anybody here who can tell us what it's going to look like in two weeks. And um, we're going to try to delay the chancellor. And I have talked a lot about this delay as much as we possibly can uh, until we have to make a decision. Got it. Um, what role is the PAC 12 or the NC2A playing right now in all this? Or is it every school for itself? Because, the epidemiological environment is so different for every campus. Yeah. Well, certainly every campus has a little bit of a different challenge. You know, I think right now Southern Cal and the LA area, you know, they're really, they're really in it up to, you know, up to their neck. But um, 
I think what this really has done for college athletics, it's really um, helped all athletic directors and probably chancellors and presidents um, be even more communicative and more collegiate uh, than we probably normally would be. We're all competitive and normally we're all trying to, you know, find a way to get a little bit of an edge. But during this pandemic, it's been collegiality, it's been sharing, it's been talking about, you know, different ways we're doing business. And so um, the NCAA has really played probably a minor role, but the, the commissioners of the five power five conferences um, and our PAC 12 commissioner, Larry Scott, and all of our ADs, we've spent at least three mornings a week, my day starts with all the ADs and the PAC 12 leadership. And that's, that's how it starts. And then, um, you know, when we need to today, I had three meetings with them. So I really feel like the PAC 12 has been a key player in this, has been a leader in it. Um, I would say we have the best medical staff advising us of anybody in the country. And you can imagine when you put the schools that we have and you pick out the best epidemiologists and the best researchers and the best, uh, you know, the best in this field, we are blessed to have people who are experts. And so we've tapped into those both from our campus. You know, John Schwartzberg's been a huge help and also from all the Pac-12 campuses. So, so more of the Pac-12 and more of the ADs of the Pac-12 uh, along with the commissioner have really worked hard to be synchronized because in the beginning we were fighting over, you know, what's going to happen with all these student athletes that just lost their season, their spring season. And, you know, we offered them the opportunity to come back. In our case, we had about 60 initially, and we'll probably get 10 to 12 that'll actually come back. Um, part of the challenge is at Cal, it's really hard to get into our graduate programs. And so some of our, some of our kids who have been incredible students, when you're trying to get into one of the top business schools in the country or law schools in the country, uh, you just may not get accepted. And yep. so uh, we ended up with about 12 that'll come back for another year of eligibility. Got it. Here's a question from Allison and Steve, who uh, apparently heard you talk last year, and they say last summer you mentioned that you'd be doing meet and greets with campus communities, including face-to-face uh, -face meetings with uh, skeptical members of faculty. And by that, I assume they mean members of faculty who are skepti skeptical or even disapproving of the fact that a place like Berkeley has a D1 program of the sort that we do. Um, and they mention how, you know, you got the sense that you were being watched. So they ask, um, how are you continuing to bridge and build that relationship um, between athletics and faculty at Cal? Yeah, it's been an important part of what I've tried to do over my first two years. And, and um, I, I've been able to use the fact that I was a faculty member long before I got into athletics as a way to open the door. And I'll, I'll share one story. When I, when I first arrived, I was told that there was a particular faculty member that was, um, you know, really did not believe athletics should be on, you know, on campuses. And so I wrote him and said, I'd love to, you know, this whole long note about I'm the new AD and I'd love to meet with you. And, and the response I got back was why? So after this wonderful <laughs> note, it was a one word why. And then I went back through my explanation and I finally got an audience of 30 minutes on a Thursday from four to 4.30. And so I sat outside like a little undergraduate outside his office <laughs> waiting for four o'clock to come. And finally I, I got let in and we sat down and talked. And at seven o'clock, three hours later, my executive assistant texted me and said, if I don't hear from you in 10 minutes, I'm calling the authorities. <laughs> Figuring I'd been tied up and, and was being sacrificed limb by limb or something. But at the end, this faculty member stood up and said for 33 years I've been here, and it's the first time anyone from athletics has ever come over and talked to me. And uh, I really admire you. And now we're pen pals. And instead of going to the Chronicle when he has an issue with athletics, he calls me. I explain it. And then when the Chronicle calls me, he says, nope, I have no issues with that. Um, you know, I've talked to the AD. So, uh, you know, it's, it's small victories. We've been very transparent. The Chancellor has really helped me get in front of the Faculty Senate, Divco, and other groups. Uh, to talk about whether it's budget or other things we're trying to do in a very, very transparent way um, so that, yeah, you know, we don't have secrets. We're trying to do this the right way and we're working hard to do it the right way. And, you know, I'd love to say we're doing everything right, but when we don't, we go back and we fix it and, and drive on. Um, 
You know, this reminds me, Jim, uh, you and I met actually a couple of weeks before you actually started working at Calvi, told me my job was to prepare you as if you needed preparation for your first uh, press conference. And I played the role of an angry reporter or, or a snarky reporter. And I said, you know, you, somebody's gonna probably ask you, you know, Jim, you spent a career in the US military and now you're coming to the heartbed of anti-American socialism in the city of Berkeley. And you kind of laughed and you kind of said, they'll never ask me that question. It was the first question they asked you at the news conference. Uh, stepping back from all this, what's your ride at Berkeley been like? Um, is it the place you imagined it to be? What surprised you? And I mean, how has it been? Because, you know, on the face of it, there's somewhat of a culture clash there between the Berkeley campus and the U.S. military. Yeah. Well, Dan, you were really my first exposure. And <laughs> after you asked me, you know, we called it a murder board, all the questions you were asking me. And, you know, after I had said to you, there's no way anyone would ask me that. And that was one of the first questions. And I had to look over at you with that <laughs> grin that you have on right now. And and say, darn it, I, I, I did not want to have to do that. Uh, I have to tell you, it's, it's been better than I ever could imagine. And, and I think um, it's important for this group to hear that I have never felt so welcomed by our alums, by our fans. I feel like everybody cares about our student athletes, cares about Cal passionately, and, uh, and people are invested. People are invested. They're willing to help when we're you know, when we're challenged and we need help. And uh, I have not had the experience of reaching out to alums and, and having to say, no, I don't really care to help or I don't really think, um, you know, this is important. And, uh, and so that's been just so incredibly heartwarming. And yeah, no, I've, I've had a blast. And I think, um, you know, after that press conference, surviving that, I think one of my other questions was, um, Jim, what do you think in your background has prepared you for the bureaucracy that is the University of California education system. And, and I said, well, I've worked for the federal government for 30 years, so I'm hoping that will help me at least a little bit. And, uh, and the reporter said, touche after that, you know, got it. So, uh, no, but it's been a lot of fun. It's been a great ride. And I can tell you, I've been part of a lot of great teams and never before have I had a team like we have both in the athletic department and, and, uh, and the chancellor's cabinet, and, and then the group of alums that we're surrounded by. So that's been fun. Beautiful. Um, Going to go back to some questions that have come in from folks watching. Talk to us a little bit about, um, and this is going to be a multi-part, but let's start generally. What's the department doing to support student athletes? Um, you know, beyond things that are strictly related to their sports and to training, and perhaps beyond their academic interest, but just on, on that human level, what's the department doing right now? That's a good question. I think it starts with our coaches. Our coaches have really been communicative. And I've, I've told you, I've talked to student athletes at other schools who have talked to our student athletes and said, yeah, we've heard from our coach twice since March, where our coaches are talking either every week or every two weeks as, as a group you know, and I laugh, even Jack Clark, and if you know Jack Clark, um, Jack Clark didn't know how to spell Zoom either when this started, and now he's doing Zoom calls with all 55 student athletes in eight different countries who are waking up at one in the morning or two in the morning and, and just sharing, keeping them in, in, uh, in the loop. You know, early on, we had some student athletes that were struggling with nutrition, and we were able to send care packages based on um, the NCAA rules. And so we were sending care packages. We sent some, some equipment to people who didn't have a place to work out. So we were able to send rubber bands and, you know, some things, you know, that they could use at home and, and get workouts. Um, and I think the biggest thing is just getting their teams together. I think there's, you know, we talk about the mental health challenges. I think the isolation has been a real challenge for a group of people who are so used to, um, having that camaraderie every single day in a locker room. I can tell you for me, the best part of this job, and there's a lot of best parts, but it's going to practices and talking to student athletes. It's getting up during a, you know, a 30 minute break between meetings and, and plopping down in the head basketball coach's office or the football coach's office or the track coach's office. And, and not having that, um, you know, you miss a little bit of that energy that everybody brings. Got it. <laughs> So same vein, 
um, coming from the same place about student support. Talk to us a little bit about uh, scholarships. So for example, if a student athlete is in a non-revenue generating sport and they're unable to play because of COVID or because they're not coming to campus, do they still, do they get to keep their scholarship? Yep, we've guaranteed their scholarship this year if they don't feel safe. Um, then we said we will continue to honor your scholarship if you don't come back uh, to campus. Which you can imagine is a huge commitment, uh, but I think it's the right thing to do for you know our student athletes. Speaking of scholarships, somebody else asked, do you have a, a and can you give us an estimate or maybe you know the exact number of how many of those 800 plus student athletes are on are on full scholarships right now? Full scholarships, I probably couldn't do that because what happens is teams break them up. Each team is authorized a max number of scholarships based on the NCAA. And um, in many of our sports, we don't have the max. So, you know, if you look at beach volleyball, for instance, they can have up to, I think it's eight, and we only have one because that's all we can afford right now. So our coaches, you know, is putting a team on the field, you know, with one hand tied behind their back. And the fact that we continue to, have great performances is awesome. But um, yeah, I would have to go back and do a lot of adding to, to get to it. But we have 85 scholarships in football, full scholarships, and um, you know, probably a total of 200 um, out of the 850. Got it. Next question is about Edward Stadium. Uh, this person asks, uh, Justin asks, what is the future of Edward Stadium? There used to be talk about converting the space to student housing. Is that idea still on the table? You know, I've talked to the chancellor at length about this and she's committed because uh, I didn't want to hire a new track and field coach if they weren't going to have a place to compete. And, um, and she said, nope, we're going to have, we're, we're supporting uh, Edward Stadium, the track. And, you know, we may not have those two massive uh, stands on either side because one has been, seismically condemned and another one is close to that. So, you know, we may do some things on the outside, but uh, uh, we will have Edwards Stadium there for our teams to compete. So we talked earlier about the football season. What about other sports that have fall seasons? What's your assessment? Are there any sports that you know already will not be competing this fall or vice versa that you know for sure will be competing because perhaps the nature of the sport? The only team that we know won't be competing is field hockey because their league um, said they're not going to compete in the fall. So um, they won't compete the two soccers and volleyball and the two cross countries, men's and women. Um, they will, they will, um, we're, we're kind of working through it. We just went to just PAC 12 competitions. So we're not going to play any non-conference and, um, and again, that's, again, one of those like football that we're continuing to evaluate uh, over the next couple of weeks. Got it. Um, and as you start to think, how are you thinking about this whole situation right now, Jim? Do you think, is planning based on the assumption or presumption that it's going to be relatively short term, it's going to be a year, or are you thinking this is something going to have long lasting impacts? And then take your answer and talk to us about how it's affecting your thinking about recruiting. About what was the last part about recruiting? About recruiting, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I would say this. I mean, I'm, I'm really banking on the fact that we, had, we, were, we were hitting on all cylinders before we went into this. I really felt good. And I think this is going to be temporary because I think we're going to have a, a vaccine. We're going to have some other things that are going to – kind of take this thing that has been out of control and, and put it in a box. Uh, it'll probably be like the flu where we go through a flu season, but um, I'm, I'm banking on that by next year at this time, we'll be in a far different spot uh, than we are today. Now I'm hoping that's not wishful thinking and, you know, I'm an optimist at heart, uh, but I'm also a realist. Um, as far as, as uh, the recruiting, I think Justin Wilcox has had the best year of recruiting during COVID uh, since his arrival. And the number of three and four star recruits that just continue to commit, like I called him and said, Justin, what are you doing? I mean, where is the magic dust that you're coming up with? And he said, Jim, I can't explain it, but we've been very engaging. We've done lots of Zoom calls with parents and, 
And um, he says, I think the fact that um, we've been on this upward trajectory, people see that you can get the best education uh, and also get to compete at the highest level. And, and that's just a great combination for student athletes. So I'm excited. And each of our teams, our basketball teams have both had similar recruiting. Our swim teams have had phenomenal recruiting. And so, um, yeah, I'd like to say, let's just stay in this COVID thing for another five or six years. And we'll really have our, our <laughs> outfitted well, but uh, I know they're all ready to, to get out and compete. So um, yeah, let's get rid of this COVID. All right. Um, we're just about at the end. I'm going to give you a chance to have some closing thoughts, but of course, uh, Tuck Coop has another question. He seems dismayed that you don't have a large sophisticated library in your background. He clearly wasn't paying attention that you're sitting in your kitchen and I don't know what Tuck has in his kitchen, but I know that my friend Jim Nolan does not keep his library in his kitchen. And I, I just, I'm worried about Tuck since he left Northern California. I'm just happy to have the Zoom working <laughs> after going all day. So, uh, but uh, and Tuck, it's good to hear you. I haven't had any grief from you in at least two weeks. So, so thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, no, no so, library in the kitchen here in the Knowlton residence. Uh, so Jim, we're just, we're just about at the end here, but, um, you know, I think the questions we got were great and, you know, just in, with keeping, you know, thinking about the fact that we're talking to a, a, an audience of alumni who care about the campus, care about the program, maybe just some closing thoughts about, you know, your hopes for the year, your thoughts for the year and the message you want people to come away with right sure. now. I, I think first and foremost, and, and I said it earlier, we're blessed to have Chancellor Chris leading right now and, you know, I've watched her, and you can imagine I've watched leaders my whole life, um, um, you know, throughout a military career and then also in, uh, in ac academics and athletics. And I'm just so proud of what she's doing and how our cabinet works together uh, in a way that um, it's just a special team. And, and I think for us, uh, so much of this is about hope. You know, I think as long as we're doing the right things to tamp this thing down, um, the hope is that we will be back to, maybe it's a new normal, but it'll be whatever is normal. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to continue to educate young men and women at the University of California. And, uh, and I, I, they're getting a great education. Our kids, even though they were at home doing it on a computer, had their best grades in the history of our school. Now, maybe that was good because our kids are really disciplined and they're used to that. And, you know, this, this new way of life fits what they, what they do when you're disciplined and, and uh, do that for a living. But I, I think we're going to come out of this. I think I'm, I'm so thankful for all the support of our alums. I really am. And uh, I'm hoping next year when I do this talk uh, that we're back on gold stage and I can smell a fire burning and, and uh, just came from the dining hall and, and had a great meal. So uh, hopefully I'll see you all at the Lair of the Bear. And, and again, just thanks for all you do. And thanks for your support. And go Bears. Go Bears. Jim, thank you so much for your time. I only make one correction. If you do go back to the Lair next summer, you'll need to be on the blue stage because <laughs> we love our camps equally. Um, but really, I really want to thank you on behalf of everybody for your generosity with your time and willingness to answer all the tough questions and just say that I keep hope. You, I hope you keep doing what you're doing and don't go changing. And uh, thanks to all the Lair campers. Be safe, be well, and please keep your distance. Good night.